As I was coming up to the platform, John says to me, he says, it's going to be tough to top that. <laughs> well, that's probably true. Uh, but let's hear it one more time for these kids. What a great job they did, our leadership. We're so thankful for what God has done. Um, but today we, we just want to express uh, our, our love. And we start by expressing our love to our children. And we recognize and acknowledge that through our kids, there's such potential. Um, there is, there's our dreams and visions um, are wrapped up in them. Uh, our, vision, our vision and mission here at the Hill is that we're, we're building followers of Jesus in every generation. And today you began to see that as the foundation is being laid in these kids' lives. And so when we look at these kids today, our hearts well up with love. And that's what we're talking about. This is the third Sunday in Advent. It is love, the hope for love. Uh, Dionne Warwick said it best. What the world needs now is, come on, love, sweet love. And that's just what there's too little of in our world. But Christmas is all about the incredible love of God. In John 3.16, it says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, everybody say whosoever, whosoever. it's not limited by gender or culture or creed, whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. A friend of mine named Dick Foth years ago coined a, a definition, came up with a definition of love, and I love it. I love his definition of love. And here it is. It says, love is the accurate estimate and the adequate supply of another person's need. Love is the accurate estimate and the adequate supply of another person's need. And when we think of that in context of John 3.16, what we needed most was a savior. I heard a long time ago, someone said, if our greatest need had been for information, God would have sent us a teacher. If our greatest need would have been technology, he would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been for money, well, that is probably one of our greatest needs. But if it had been our greatest need, he would have sent us an accountant. But our greatest need was reconciliation with God. We needed forgiveness. We couldn't find it anywhere else. And so he sent to us a savior. Our son Andrew just completed his EMT course and uh, last week, he led our um, all-call devotional. We have a devotional for our volunteers and staff before we serve you on a Sunday morning. And during the all-call devotional, he began to relay an analogy on how first responders really demonstrate love. Because when you call a first responder, when you have a need, when you are in pain, the, the very first thing that they're going to do is they're going to try to assess what your need is. They need to be able to do that before they can adequately supply what you're looking for. So they ask things like, where's the pain? And when did the pain start? Can you describe the pain? Is it like a one or a 10, somewhere in between? Have you tried to, to do anything to make the pain go away? How long has this pain been going on? And when we think of that, that definition of love, those are really questions that we would ask of God or he would ask of us. God knows the pain that we were in. We say, oh God, I've had this pain. I have a pain of, of, of the weight of my sin. I have the pain of the consequences of my poor decision, oh God. And it really began during, uh, during my childhood or even at the beginning uh, of my life. And so God being able to see our greatest needs was able to assess the solution and what was going to be the cure. And so what did he do? But he sent Jesus, his expression of love. Remember the time of Moses, God was like an EMT. It says that he heard the groaning of his people under the bondage of slavery in Egypt. And so what he did was he called upon a deliverer whose name was Moses. And similarly, all mankind has been groaning under the effects of sin. And no matter how we've tried to make the pain go away, nothing that we can do really works. In fact, if we're honest, a lot of the times what we do to try to make the pain go away only makes things worse. So God's cure was to send us grace and forgiveness. And he did it because he loves us and to show us the unconditional love of Jesus 
that he freely gives to every one of us. And so I asked the question this morning, what better way to demonstrate unconditional love than by sending us a baby? You know, I thought I knew what love was. You know, I, I grew up in a good family. My parents loved me. I've had friends and I know that they love me. And then when I was a teenager, I met my wife, Betsy. And brother, I knew what love was. <laughs> Gotta tell you what, fireworks. But I'm gonna tell you, several years after we were married and our firstborn son, Tom, came into the world, when I first held him in my arms, that's when I knew love. There was just such an unconditional love that I felt toward this little child that I held. It was unconditional. When I looked at him, I saw perfection. When I held him, I, I, I knew there was potential in this new life. And I even saw some of myself. Come on, let's be honest. When we look at our kids, we're like, yeah, there I am. He hadn't done anything yet. He hadn't even soiled a diaper. But I saw perfection. I saw love. I knew love. It was just love. And I think that's how God sees you and me. God sees you. For those of you that don't know that, God sees you. He's not like Santa where he sees you when you're sleeping. He knows if you've been naughty or nice. No, I want to talk about that kind of seeing you. God sees you. He knows your pain. He knows what you need. He sees you. And when he sees you, he sees his image in you. He sees you as part of his family. And like God, when, when, when God told Moses, he said, you know, I've chosen Israel. He says, I've chosen Israel to be my people. And I'm going to tell you, it wasn't because they're the biggest nation. It wasn't because they're the strongest people. In fact, the reason why I chose them is because I just love them. I just love them. And when you look at your child, you say, I haven't done anything yet, but I see so much potential. I see so much in them. I just love them. God allows us. And I, and, and I just want us to feel that this morning, that that love that you have toward your child pales in comparison to the love that God has for you. But God allows us to get a glimpse of what his love is like through our children. God sees you and me. The Bible tells us that he sent Jesus because of his great love for us. So what better way for God to communicate his love for us, an unconditional love, than by sending us a baby? When you hold your baby, God, you get a glimpse of how much God loves you. The second thing, babies, though they are small and frail, are very powerful. I hear one crying in the service right now. And when it, if a child, if a baby lets go in a service, it doesn't matter what I say, everybody's going to be thinking about that baby crying. They are small and they are frail, but they are powerful. A baby can change the atmosphere of a room. I remember um, years ago, my mother was dying of cancer. She was in the hospital and uh, we made a trip home, probably the last one to see her while she was still alive. And we had three children at the time. The oldest two, we had to leave back home. And we, uh, we took our, our youngest son, Jesse, with us. He was only two or three months old, but we needed to take him. And I will never forget walking into the hospital room where my mother was laying, dying. And how that just bringing this little baby into that room changed the atmosphere of the room. When we placed him in her arms and for that moment that she was meeting him and she was able to know that this was her grandson, all of the pain and all of the sorrow and all of the stress from her condition found some relief. There was new life being held in her arms. I'm going to tell you, babies are small, but they're powerful. They can change the atmosphere in a room. Uh, this week, Asia brought in little Ezra. Uh, Asia and Micaiah have had a little baby named Ezra. And this week, uh, uh, 
uh, Asia brought Ezra into the room. And I was standing in the workroom in the, in the office. And I walked into the room and there she is just holding him. And I forgot all about what I was there for. I didn't know. Now, that's partly because I'm old. But, but not, <laughs> that wasn't the only reason I forgot what I was there for. It's because I, I, look, I saw her holding this baby. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, nothing else matters. Let's just focus right now on this child. And he was there and he was so sweet and he was so all like a magnet. He just drew all of the attention in the room. Babies are small, but they are powerful. Amen. Amen. There was a, a Athenian politician named Themistocles. And this is what he said about his own child. He said, the Athenians are the masters of the Greeks and the Greeks are the masters of the world. And I am master of the Athenians. And my wife is master of me. But that baby is the master of his mother. Therefore, that child is the master of the world. <laughs> I read back in 1809, Napoleon was master of Europe. And all eyes were on him. But the future really belonged to those who were born in that year. Because in that year of 1809, it was the same year that Abraham Lincoln was born, Gladstone, Tennyson, Poe, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Cyrus McCormick, Chopin, and Mendelssohn. All of them were born in that same year. And all of Napoleon's battles were far outweighed by the potential and the destiny of those babies that were born in that single year. And we think about potential, we think about the baby Moses, as I've made, made reference to him this morning. Rescued from the Nile River, raised by Pharaoh's daughter, destined to be the one who was to deliver Israel from Egypt. There's great power and there's great potential in a baby. And Moses was a type and shadow of Jesus who came to deliver us from the curse of slavery to sin. And in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 3, they make the reference that one who is greater than Moses has come. His name is Jesus. When Jesus was brought to the temple, he was just eight days old. In Luke chapter 2, verses 30 to 32, Simeon, who was a devout, righteous man, was in the temple and he had spent much of his life waiting for the Lord's Christ. He wanted to see with his own eyes the Messiah. And when Jesus was brought in to be dedicated, just eight days old, Simeon was able by the power of the Spirit to see and recognize the potential that was in that small life that Mary was holding in her arms. He said this, Luke chapter 2. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Though Jesus, just eight days old, always was, already was being recognized for the potential that was in him. And Jesus came as a baby, and for he was spoken of, in Genesis 3.15, one of the reasons why God came in the form of a baby is spoken way back in the beginning in, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. You see, the, sin of, uh, the curse of sin had put upon all mankind would need to end. And the very first promise of the end of that curse and salvation is found there in this verse. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Speaking now to the serpent, the perpetrator of temptation and the one who brought sin into the world. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. So this Christ, this baby must come, this offspring, in order to grow and crush the head of the serpent. And as the scriptures say, put all things, settle once for all and put all things under his feet. So babies teach us about the unconditional love that God has for us. And babies, though small and frail, are powerful and have a lot of potential. But third, Christmas is all about a baby. And this baby is for us. In Luke chapter 2, verses 11 
It says, for to you, to you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. See, this baby wasn't born just for Mary and Joseph. He was born for the shepherds. He was born for the magi. And he was born for you and for me. For unto you, didn't say unto Mary and Joseph was born. For unto you this day has been born a savior. God sent a baby to all of us to embrace. If you will, he is our child. For he has made us part of his family. And we know that Christ was born to Mary, but the angel of the Lord seems to indicate and communicate to us that this baby was born to all who need a savior. That means all of us, for we've all been born under the curse of sin. This baby has been born to deliver us. There's no other baby that's been born that's like this baby that was born in Bethlehem. That's kind of a tongue twister. And you know how I love songs? You know, I always get a rock song. And so as I was thinking, this baby was born to us. This is my baby. Be my, be my baby. My one and only baby. Be my, anyway, that's, forget it. I had, I had to have a song. I can't preach a sermon without having a song. Be my baby. He's your baby. If this baby truly is everybody's baby, then the whole human race potentially becomes family once again. Isn't that awesome? And what better unites a family than a baby? And you can have beef with some other member of your family, but they have a baby. It's like, let's forget all about that for a minute. Oh, oh, look at the baby. Oh, so sweet, right? The human race was shattered and divided by Adam, but through this baby, our human family can be reconciled. And you know, isn't, you think about, well, what, have you ever thought, you, you, you know, you want to get your dad a, 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 a Christmas present? You say, what, what, what would he want? What does he want? And you always want to get something your dad is going to like. I can think of nothing more that our Heavenly Father would want this Christmas than to see his children reconciled. And Jesus is the one who he sent so that we could all focus on the same thing. And with that common faith and love, come to him, be united. That's the greatest gift that I think he, we could give to him. The Bible says, for as in Adam all die, through Christ all are made alive. A young lady named Jennifer needed a bone marrow transplant to stay alive. And neither of her parents had the right tissue to match. And so all depended upon the birth of their next child. Seven months later, Jennifer, this little girl who needed a bone marrow transplant, seven months later, her brother Eric was born and his marrow matched. Eric became the youngest donor in U.S. history. And what Eric was to Jennifer, Jesus is to you and I. Because his blood is a perfect match to ours. The disease that sin has caused, his blood will cleanse. He was pure and holy enough because he was God and he was man. And he was enough for God. And that's what really mattered. This baby was born to you on Christmas morning. And so the question I want to ask this morning, will you hold him? Will you hold him? Will you receive him? It's crazy when we think about it, when we think about receiving this newborn, we feel like we're adopting him into our family, but really what he's doing when we receive him is he's adopting us into his family. And God wants you to be part of his family. He's destined you to be part of his family. 
Yesterday, while I was looking, I saw a post by one of our missionaries, Don Triplett. He put this. He said, each of us is an innkeeper who decides if there's room for Jesus. What a great quote. Each of us is an innkeeper who decides if we'll make room for Jesus. Would you stand with me this morning? There's an old song that was running through my head this morning. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. No, don't give me the awk. That only encourages me. But there's an old song that says, Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Father, we thank you. Thank you for your precious gift to us. This baby that adopts us. This one that we receive, yet he's the one that adopts us. Thank you for welcoming us into your family. God, I pray that each one of us today would make room in our hearts, in our lives, that we would accept your invitation to be adopted into your family through our faith in the one who you sent, who was the accurate estimate and the adequate supply of everything that we need. We bless you today. We thank you. And today, if you would, would just... In this moment that you have with God before we leave, would say to God, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay. Because as you have this conversation with God and as you express faith in him, it, it's just the beginning. Jesus came and he, he died, but the good news is that he rose again from the dead and he offers to us that life. And so we thank you that the birth of Jesus began an unending eternal story. We thank you, God. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The last thing that I want to ask you today is this. Is because this child is born unto you, he's also born unto the person next to you and born unto every person that you will meet. Maybe this Christmas, would you think about sharing this bundle of joy that you have? And just do it like that. Reminder that this baby is the one who brings us the joy that we couldn't find anywhere else. And I don't know about you, but uh, you know, when, when you're with someone and they ha have a newborn and they say, would you like to hold the baby? Oh my gosh. I mean, that freaks out some of us. I'll just admit, you know, you're like, you're going you're gonna to drop him or her or whatever, you know. But, but honestly, it's just kind of like this honor. It's like, you, me? Me? I get to hold the baby? I get to, and then you do and everything breaks down inside of you and you start making these crazy faces and you start goo-goo and gaga and mumbling and, you know, because there's something so attractive about this little life. Jesus is this little life that's very attractive. Would you consider offering someone, hold my baby? After the service this morning, if you would like prayer, we invite you to come. We'd love just to share with you for the moments that we have. And don't forget that the celebration continues in that next week in the morning, 9, 30, and 11. We have Christmas Eve services. It gives you plenty of time to celebrate throughout the rest of the day. But be sure to join us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the peace. Thank you, God, for the joy. Thank you for the love and the hope that you give to us. We pray, God, today that you would bless all of our children who were with us today on stage. We thank you for the life and the potential that's in them. Thank you for the opportunity we have to love them. Help us to love them the way you do. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. 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 God bless you, everybody. Have a wonderful day.